Hello, my mighty companion. Here we are reading with the Course Companion Group. We are on day 110, section 4 of chapter 7, the extension of the kingdom. And section 4, healing and the changelessness of the mind. If you will please join with me in prayer. Dear Father, please enable me to set aside everything that I think I know about today's reading, about A Course in Miracles, about myself, about you, and about this world, God, and everyone in it. God, please allow me to have Christ's vision, your vision, an open mind, and a new experience. I thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, so section four, healing and the changelessness of the mind. The body is nothing more than a framework for developing abilities. It is therefore a means for developing potentials, which is quite apart from the potentials, from what the potentials are used for. This is a decision. The effects of the ego's decision in this matter are so apparent that they need no elaboration here. But the Holy Spirit's decision to use the body only for communication has such a direct connection with healing that it does need clarification. The unhealed healer obviously does not understand his own vocation. Only minds communicate. Since the ego cannot obliterate the impulse to communicate, because it is also the impulse to create, to create. It can only try to teach you that the body can both communicate and create, and therefore does not need the mind. The ego then tries to teach you that the body can act like the mind and therefore is self-sufficient. But we have learned that behavior is not the level for either learning or teaching. Footnote 24, text chapter 142. You are asked to behave toward other, others as you would have them behave toward you. This means that your perception of both must be accurate since the golden rule is the order for appropriate behavior. You can't behave appropriately unless you perceive accurately, because appropriate behavior depends on lack of level confusion. Text chapter 2, section 9. You believe that you're responsible for what you do, but not for what you think. The truth is that you are responsible for what you think, because it is only at this level that you can exercise choice. What you do comes from what you think. This must be so because you can act in accordance with what you do not believe. But this will weaken you as a teacher and a learner because it has been repeatedly, as it has been repeatedly emphasized, you teach what you do believe. Footnote 25. Text chapter 6, section 1. Remember always that what you believe you will teach. Believe with me and we will become equal as teachers. Text chapter 6, 1. The behavior that results is a lesson in blame. Just as all behavior teaches the beliefs that motivate it. And then there's a listing as well with um, other sections in chapter 6 that you can read if you'd like to pause the video. An inconsistent lesson will be poorly taught and poorly learned. If you are teaching both sickness and healing, you are both a poor teacher and a poor learner. Healing is the one ability which everyone can develop and must develop if he is to be healed. Healing is the Holy Spirit's form of communication and the only one he knows. He recognizes no other because he does not accept the ego's confusion of mind and body. 
Minds can communicate, but they cannot hurt. The body in the service of the ego can hurt other bodies, but this cannot occur unless the body has already been confused with the mind. This fact, too, can be used either for healing or for magic. But you must realize that magic is always the belief that healing is harmful. Footnote 26. We believe this means that when a body has been injured by another body, we can respond to that injury with either true healing or with magical healing. We must realize, however, that even though magic may heal the body, it is secretly against true healing. As the next paragraph makes clear, magic ultimately weakens the very one it would heal by seeing him as inherently lacking the special something that the healer possesses. This is its totally insane premise, and so it proceeds accordingly. Healing only strengthens, magic always tries to weaken. Healing perceives nothing in the healer that everyone else does not share with him. Magic always sees something special in the healer, which he believes he can offer as a gift to someone who does not have it. He may believe that this gift comes from God to him, but it is quite evident that he does not understand God if he thinks he has something that others do not. You might as well ask why some healing can result from this kind of thinking, and there is a real reason for this. However misguided the magical healer may be, and however he may be trying to strengthen his ego, he is also trying to help. He is conflicted and unstable, but at times he is offering something to the sonship, and, and the only thing that the sonship can accept is healing. When the so-called healing works, then the impulses both to help and be helped have coincided. This is coincidental because the healer may not be experiencing himself as truly helpful at the time, and the belief that he is in the mind of another helps him. The Holy Spirit does not work by chance, and healing that is of him always works. And unless the healer always heals by him, the results will vary. But healing itself is consistence. Footnote 27. Consistence is a cinnamon, cinnamon. It's a synonym of consistency that is rarely used now. However, since Jesus uses it five times in this section, we have decided to retain it. It refers to consistency over time, to parts cohering together in a harmonious union, and to the degree of firmness or thickness with which the su a substance holds together. Okay, I'm going to start that sentence over. But healing itself is consistence because only consistence is conflict-free and only the conflict-free are whole. By accepting exceptions and acknowledging that he can sometimes heal and sometimes not, the healer is obviously accepting inconsistence. He is therefore in conflict and teaching conflict. Can anything of God not be for all and always? Love is incapable of any exceptions. Only if there is fear does the whole idea of exceptions of any kind seem to be meaningful. Exceptions are fearful because they were made by fear. The fearful healer is a contradiction in terms and is therefore a concept concept that only a conflicted mind could possibly perceive as meaningful. Fear does not gladden. Healing does. Fear always makes exceptions. Healing never does. Fear produces dissociation because it induces separation. Healing always induces integration 
because it proceeds from harmony. Healing is predictable because it can be counted on. Everything that is of God can be counted on because everything of God is wholly real. Healing can be counted on because it is inspired by His voice and is in accord with His laws. But if healing is consistent, it cannot be inconsistently understood. Understanding means consistence because God means consistence. And because that is His meaning, it is also yours. Your meaning cannot be out of accord with His because your whole meaning and your only meaning comes from His and is like His. God cannot be out of accord with Himself, and you cannot be out of accord with Him. You cannot separate yourself from your Creator who created you by sharing His being with you. The unhealed healer wants gratitude from his brothers, but he is not grateful to them. This is because he thinks he is giving something to them and is not receiving something equally desirable in return. His teaching is limited because he is learning so little. His healing lesson is limited by his own ingratitude, which is a lesson in sickness. Learning is constant and so vital in its power for change that a son of God can recognize his power in an instant and change the world in the next. That is because by changing his mind, he has changed the most powerful device that was ever created for change. This in no way contradicts the changelessness of mind as God created it. But you think that you have changed it as long as you learn through the ego. This does place you in a position of needing to learn a lesson which seems contradictory. You must learn to change your mind about your mind. Only by this can you learn that it is changeless. When you heal, that is exactly what you are doing. You are recognizing the changeless mind in your brother by perceiving that he could not have changed his mind. That is how you perceive the Holy Spirit in him. It is only the Holy Spirit in him that never changes his mind. He himself must think he can or he could not perceive himself as sick. He therefore does not know what his self is. If you see only the changeless in him, you have not really changed him at all. But by changing your mind about his for him, you help him undo the change his ego thinks it has made in him. As you can hear two voices, so you can see in two ways. One way shows you an image or better, an idol, which you may worship out of fear, but which you will never love. The other shows you only truth, which you will love because you will understand it. Understanding is appreciation because what you understand, you can identify with. And by making it part of you, you have accepted it with love. This is how God created you, in understanding, in appreciation, and in love. The ego is totally unable to understand this because it does not understand what it makes. It does not appreciate it, and it does not love it. It incorporates to take away. It literally believes that every time it deprives someone of something, it has increased. We have spoken of the increase of the kingdom by your creations, which can only be created as, your, as you were. And now we'll go down to footnote 28. Footnote 28, text chapter 4, section 10. God, who encompasses all being, nevertheless created distinct beings who have everything individually, but who want to share it to increase their joy. Nothing that is real can be increased except by sharing it. 
Text chapter 5, section 5. Everything that can continue has already been born, but it can increase as you are willing to return the part of your mind that needs healing to the higher part and thus render your creating undivided. Text chapter 6, section 8. If you create God and He created you, the kingdom could not increase through its own creative thought. He created the sonship and you increase it. Again, section 8 of chapter 6. God extends outward beyond limits and beyond time. And you who are co-creator with Him extend His kingdom forever and beyond limits. Chapter 6, Section 8 again. What is timeless is always there because its being is eternally changeless. It does not change by increase because it was forever created to increase. Chapter 7, Section 1. And his sons who create like him follow it gladly, knowing that the increase of the kingdom depends on it just as their creation did. That was 28. Thank you. Sorry. The whole glory and the perfect joy is that the kingdom lies in you to give. Do you not want to give it? You cannot forget the Father because I am with you and I cannot forget him. To forget me is to forget yourself and him who created you. Our brothers are forgetful. That is why they need your remembrance of me and him who created me. 29. Luke 22:19. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Through this remembrance, you can change their minds about themselves as I can change yours. Your mind is so powerful a light that you can look into theirs and enlighten them, as I can enlighten yours. I do not want to share my body in communion because this is to share nothing. Would I try to share an illusion with the most holy children of a most holy father? Footnote 30. Most holy is a phrase found often in the Old Testament, usually referring to aspects of the temple worship, especially the holy of holies, the inner sanctum of the temple, visited only once a year by the high priest. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Exodus 30.10 In the course, it is usually applied to us. We are God's most holy Son. In this passage, what is most holy is God and his children, not the body of Jesus that is supposedly shared in the Eucharist. But I do want to share my mind with you because we are one mind and that mind is ours. See only this mind everywhere because only this is everywhere and in everything. It is everything because it encompasses all things within itself. Blessed are you who perceive only this because you perceive only what is true. Footnote 31, this is an allusion to the Beatitudes, such as blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, best known from Matthew 5, 3. Come therefore unto me and learn of the truth in you. And that is footnote 32, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The mind we share is shared by all our brothers, and as we see them truly, they will be healed. 
Let your mind shine with mine upon their minds and by our gratitude to make them aware of the light in them. This light will shine back upon you and on the whole sonship because this is your proper gift to God. He will accept it and give it to the sonship because it is acceptable to him and therefore to his sons. Footnote 33 The Old Testament often speaks of what gifts are accepted by or acceptable to God. In Leviticus, only proper sacrifices and only those who offer them are accepted by God. Later, Old Testament books state that an acceptable sacrifice is a matter of the heart. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou will not despise. That's in Psalm 51, 17. In the above allusion, the gift that is acceptable to God is letting your mind shine with Jesus's upon the minds of your brothers. This is the true communion of the Spirit. 34. In other words, true communion is not the Christian Eucharist, but joining with Jesus in seeing the altar of God in everyone, and thus shining with gratitude upon them. So this is the true communion of the Spirit who sees the altar of God in everyone and by bringing it to your appreciation calls upon you to love God and His creation. And now I will read Emily Bennington's notes on this section. Section 4, Healing and the Changelessness of the Mind. The unhealed healer sees himself as superior to his patients, only some of whom he seems as worthy of healing. He wants their gratitude but is not grateful to them. His results are inconsistent. The healed healer is opposite of this in every way. By seeing the changeless mind in his patients, he helps them undo the change they think they have introduced in themselves. Reflection While there is a small percentage of the population who are called to be official healers, such as therapists, psychologists, doctors, coaches, pastors, etc. Again, in the course, we are all called to be healers in the sense that we should all seek to give healing in every interaction. Paragraph 11 tells us how to do that. For example, we are recognizing the changeless mind in your brother. And that is how you perceive the Holy Spirit in him. Thus, to be healers, we have to continually ask ourselves, Am I behaving in a healing way toward my companions? Is this having a healing effect on them? It's not enough that something we said should have, should have had a healing effect, if only the person had interpreted it correctly. The litmus test is this. Did it have a healing effect? Did they experience it as healing? This may sound surprising, but the Course often holds up the reactions of others as a litmus test, and you will know which you have chosen by their reactions. How well would you say you are practicing this aspect of the Course? Excerpts from the text. Healing is the Holy Spirit's form of communication and the only one he knows. Come therefore unto me and learn the truth in you. The mind we share is shared by all our brothers, and as we see them truly, they will be healed. Thank you for joining with me for the Course Companion reading for day 110, reading out of the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles edited by Robert Perry, and I don't know if I said that in the beginning, so I don't think I did. Thank you. I love you. Have a beautiful day.